excited to welcome back to the Kelly Alexander Show, Grammy award-winning super producer, Jimmy Jam, who has been featured in Janet Jackson's documentary and is here to talk to us all about it. Jimmy, I am so gleeful to have you on my show again. So thank you for doing this. I love that word, gleeful. I like that. I'm, I, like, I like gleeful. I don't think anybody's ever said to me, they're gleeful to see me. That's wonderful. Oh, I am. Trust me. Especially because this is it. only like our, like I've, you've been, you know, so gracious to come on my show a bunch of times. Most of them have been audio interviews. Uh, mm -hmm. We did have you last year with the the girls with the Zoom and that was amazing. But this is like our awesome. first one-on-one -on -one Zoom. So I am legit gleeful. So awesome. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. That's Thank cool. you for doing this. So um, first question I wanted to ask you, or, or I guess mention is that, um, this morning, as I was preparing for our interview, I rewatched the doc uh, to make sure I was as up to speed as possible. And one thing that I noticed as I was going through like the four sections of the doc is apart from Janet's family members, Jimmy Jam is the most featured person in this documentary. Uh, what does that mean to you? Like you're just you're you're in like every portion and, and you have like lot like there's lots of commentary from you, which I love. Well, <clears throat> it just means that I talk a lot probably um and they they couldn't they tried to edit me down and they couldn't so um i don't really know what that means but um i don't know i think it's kind of an observer of the story sort of from the beginning we have a, such a, re a unique relationship uh between janet and myself and i just think i was able to tie some loose ends together and and kind of get us from place to place you know the transitions between albums or you know moments in her life or or those types of things and so I think that's probably why they used quite a bit of things that I said. Now, several years ago, you know, true fans of, of Jam and Lewis and, and of Janet, we know that we saw footage of you guys in Minneapolis visiting the old Flight Time Studios. Do you think that that was footage that was supposed to be in the dock? Because we really didn't see that in the dock. That was intended, I think, for something else at the time that it was being done. And... Um, but yeah, we did shoot, we definitely shot a ton of stuff in Minneapolis when we were, went back there to revisit the old studios. One of which is actually, one of them is torn down now. Oh, wow. Um, and the other one is still there, but it's a, I think it's a home improvement store or something like that. So, um, but it was good that we had that. But at the time we shot that, I don't think it was necessarily for this particular documentary. But what was it like though? I don't, I don't think I got to ask you at the time. What was it like being back there with Janet, with Terry? Like, I just can't even imagine the flood of feelings that must've came over all three of you. It was so awesome because, um, literally when we went to the, the original flight time, which is now like a store, um, all of the walls and everything are still the same. Even there's a door. I, I'll never forget when she came up for, um, well, two stories come to mind. The when we played her, "What Have You Done for Me Lately?" for the first time, where she's like literally sitting on the couch watching a TV. We put the track on. She walks to the door. She leans on the door. She points at us. She points at the speakers, and she says, "Who's that for?" And we said, "Well, you, if you want it." And she said, "Oh, I want it." And that became "What Have You Done for Me Lately?" But to be in that studio space and be able to say to her, "Remember, there was a couch here." And then she said, yeah, and there was a big TV over here. And I said, yes, and you were watching TV and you leaned on this door handle and you, right, I mean, we were able to actually physically, uh, you know, manifest the, the, the memories of that I always talk about. And, um, and then when we did our little second studio, when Rhythm Nation happened, we had built a second studio out of a garage area. And there was a door that she could never open. Um, it would always stick. And it was kind of a sliding glass door. And she walked up to that door and tried to pull on it and it wouldn't open. And I said, do you remember that door never would open? That was the door to the to the studio. And she said, oh my God, yeah, I remember that. So it was just great being back in that, in that physical space and looking at where, this is where I stood when I sang, this is where the piano was, this is where the equipment was. And there's even, there's a, I don't, can't remember how they treated it, but there was this wall of outboard gear which is outboard gear is you know limiters and compressors and all the kind of things now everything's in a computer but in the old days it was all physical and i remember one day we walked in to record right at the end of rhythm nation and we had moved everything started moving everything to the next flight time and there was no equipment there to actually do the vocals and i said no you got to bring the equipment back we need to do it well that actual wall that we had cut out to put the equipment in is still there um they have something else in it now obviously but the bones of the building are exactly the same as they were. So that was great. And then going to the, 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 what ended up becoming the new flight time, 
was great too because everything there was still intact all the equipment had been moved out but the walls and everything were still the same so the place she stood like there was literally in the floor there was like where she would stand and sing there was like the, the wood was worn out at that point um but where she would stand the window she'd stand in front of um just all of those kinds of things so yeah it was amazing and it's cool that it's great that that footage exists um yeah yeah it's amazing fun. what yeah. is, what does janet feel like when um like how is she with going down memory lane because obviously she had to do a lot of it for this documentary but like how is she in general like was that was it is it something she likes doing or she's always looking forward i think it's a combination i think that um when you can actually pause for a minute um, as all of us have been, you know, in one way or another forced to do because of the pandemic and other things where you have time to maybe reflect a little bit. Um, I, I think that that it's been good for her to do because she doesn't, she is always looking forward and looking to the next thing. And so it's tough to sometimes go back um, and just stop for a minute and realize. And I always send her like little notes. Um, because like every day, I, I always say to her, every day is like a milestone in our life. Like literally every day, and the fans are so good about this, it might be the day a song releases, a, a, a song went number one, a song went platinum, a song went gold or whatever. It's always something, every single day, there's a Janet moment of some sort um, that the fans recognize. And a lot of times I'll send that to her and I'll go, hey, happy anniversary, that's the way love goes, or happy something whatever and she'll go oh my god i totally forgot about this and it's like yeah but you know so while she forgets about it and like i say is always moving forward the fans remember and they document it and they remind us and um and it's fun it's it's fun to to reminisce um just for a second i mean we don't dwell on it but it's fun to reminisce for that minute and then always then go what's the next what's the next thing we're gonna do what's the next milestone we're gonna try to achieve. But I say when you get old um, or mature, whatever word you want to use, old's fine for me, uh, you realize that you have a lot of milestones because you've done a lot of miles. And That's we've amazing. done a lot of miles. So it's great. When you were watching, because uh, I know you mentioned to me before we started the interview that you had watched the doc uh, as it came out, just like along with all of us when it came out, uh, you know, on that weekend at the end of January. Um, Obviously, you've been with Janet for so much of her career. You you know most of her story. But was there anything surprising that came out in the doc that you didn't know about her or didn't know was that maybe in, that important to her? Hmm. Probably the most. I, I don't know whether anything was like surprising to me, but I, I really enjoyed the way that it was set up with uh, her brothers. Because I think that's a point that... Um, you know, she was around just such great musicality, whether it was in her own family with her brothers um, and sisters, or whether it was, um, you know, being around the Motown camp and being around, you know, Barry Gordy or Suzanne DePass or, um, you, you know, just the great influences that she was around. And also, one of the things I, I knew, but it was nice to see a little bit of it in there, was just kind of her love of, you know, musicals and those types of things and, and why her musical palette is so wide and so unique. Um, you know, why you would have on an album, you'd have Kathleen Battle, an opera singer, and then you'd have, you know, Chuck D from Public Enemy, or, you know, you'd have... Um, Vanessa May, a you know electric violinist, um, but all of these very diverse, or or you'd have Heavy D, like it was all these diverse things, but it all came from musicals. That's where it all gelled for her. Was watching the musicals, and 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 Sid Charisse and and Cap Calloway and the Nicholas Brothers and all of that in the in the All Right video. Why she it was important for her to talk about her influences and see that. Um, I, I thought those things were really cool, and the and because it spoke to the craft i mean i think a lot of the a lot of the documentary is um it's about her as you know the superstar the family person the whatever but at the core of it is the craft that she does it's her hard work and her meticulous nature about doing things right um 
it was good to see that. I, I wasn't surprised seeing that, but I loved the going back to the when they went back to the house in Indiana. And we actually did the 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 music for that because it was interesting. She um, over the kind of over the holidays, she asked me about. Um, she said, can I, can I come and watch some of the footage? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And we went over and we spent some time together just watching the footage. And I said, how does this make you feel? And she said, I like it, except something about it doesn't quite something. And I said, oh, I said, it's the music. I said, the music needs to be something of yours rather than just a score, general score it needs to be something of yours. And so I went back and I did a piece of music and I used, if you remember in the opening, I think um, I think special is the music that we might have used. And then when she sees her brothers on the mural, we went into just the sonic of together again, not the actual song, but just the chords and kind of the sonic of it. And when I sent that idea to her, she just said, oh, my God, that's exactly that's that's perfect. That's that's what I want. Can you do all the music? And it's like, well, we can't do all the music, but we can we can do some moments like that. If there's some moments that make you feel a little bit more, you know, that hit home with you a little better. And so, um, and even like uh, using uh, 2300 Jackson Street, when it goes to that thing, was just like, that's a natural song, let's put that song in that place. So we did some music placement and some music supervising to help it out. And at the end of the day, she was happy with it. And that was, I just wanted her to watch it and feel happy as she watched it. That was important. I'm blown away that uh, we're now finding out that you actually had, a, again, a, like your stamp, the Jam and Lewis stamp on the soundtrack a bit, like too. I think it's amazing. Cause yeah, I think as we were watching, it's subtle, but fans were hearing that too. So if she was happy, then we're feeling that too as big fans of hers. So thank you, Jimmy and Terry for doing that <laughs> for us. Um, I wanted to ask too, as, as I was watching specifically the, the, the first part of the doc, but then it, it kind of came in and out throughout the rest of it. The influence of her dad, like he was a major part, like in that first section, obviously. And then he just came, like, he just seemed to be th woven in throughout. I wanted to ask you as someone again, who's been with her for so long. Um, and especially when you guys did control and that was her way of breaking free of all that. And she did manage to do that. And she did become successful on her own, but how mu much of dad was still a part of her in her career? Like, was she always like, was he somewhere there, like in her ear, even if he wasn't in her ear, like physically? That's a great question. I think um, he definitely was there. I, I think, I guess the, the words that I'm thinking of is more of a, maybe a sounding board a little bit. Like sometimes she would want to do something um, and she would always try to make sure to include her father in it only if it was just a either come see the show or maybe a what do you think about this? type of moment or this is what I'm going to do just kind of informing type of thing um but I think that was more the case out of respect more so than actually um you know seeking out you know advice or that type of thing at that point I think she pretty much had it handled but that was her dad and she wanted him to be you know at her events and at her shows and and that type of thing and he was always invited um so I, I do think that that was in that way, he certainly still remained, you know, a part of her life. And he was very proud of her. He was he was very, you know, he was a dad, you know, and, you know, it was interesting because one of the things that um, was interesting was that there was kind of the sense that maybe he gave up some of the dad side to be the manager or to be kind of the person that drove the kids, you know, for musical excellence and those types of things. And I think later on in his life, I think because of her success, um, he was able to be a little more of the dad rather than the, I'm going to give advice or I'm going to make, you know, do those types of things. Um, maybe subtly, but I think that was, that was an important thing. And, and when um, he, you know, unfortunately passed away, I got the feeling from Janet to me, just the way I interpreted it was that that's her dad. Like she's not thinking about, you know, this record deal here or this kind of thing. It was just at the end of the day, it was just, I love my father. And, you know, that's the, I think that's the way that the relationship ended. And I think that was how it should end because at the beginning, that's what he was. He was a father before he was anything else to her. That's what he was. So I think the beginning and the end of that 
was probably a good a good thing. What does Janet's mother mean to Janet? Because again, we saw a little bit of Mrs. Jackson in, in the doc, which was amazing. She still looks absolutely stunning oh my God, um, and, and smart as a tack. Um, yes. But yeah, what is what does Mrs. Jackson mean to Janet? She's everything. She's, um, you know, she was the one that really, you know, got the whole thing going. I mean, I think I think the, uh, her mom was really the one that said, you know, hey, these kids got talent and we should we should do this. I love the fact. Now, the thing I didn't know was now thinking about it was when I didn't realize she had made all of those clothes, like all of the outfits that the Jackson Five had in the beginning. I didn't realize that. I thought that was absolutely so amazing and so cool that she did that. And those outfits were amazing. So um, I thought that was really cool. But I mean, we, um, Mrs. Jackson is just I don't know. She's she's the greatest person. Like I, I always think, I guess when when wherever we're doing music with Janet or doing any sort of projects with her, I always want to see a smile on Janet's face. Like if I see a smile, then I know we're doing the right thing. Um, and I think I feel that same way about her mom. I've been around, you know, her mom where there's been moments where to watch her watch her daughter do things, and she'll get the biggest smile on her face. And I just feel like that's to me, that's the best. And um, I had a chance to spend a little time with them um, earlier in the year or well, not this year, but la in last year. Um, and we actually got into a very uh, heated game of Uno. And it was um, it was myself. It was Mama Jackson. It was Latoya, Rebe, um, all basically all the Jackson girls. I think Johnny Gill was there and we got into this Uno thing and Mrs. Jackson don't play at Uno. She, man, it was crazy. And it was funny. So at one point I was getting ready to leave. I think Janet was going to put Issa down for better, whatever. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to go. And Mrs. Jackson was like, no, no, no. We're going to play a few more hands. We're going to, I was like, okay, cool. And um, it was great. And I hadn't played Uno in, I can't remember how many years. I mean, since my kids were young, but it was awesome. And she's, you know, she's such a great lady, but she's such a great spirit. And that her determination in the, in the Uno moment <laughs> was so cool. Like, no, no, you're not going. No, we're going to play some more hands of this. Like, it was just like, okay, cool. You know, it's like, okay, whatever you say, mom, we're, we're going to do this. So yeah, I mean, she she means the world to Janet, and and it's great. She's you know, thank God she's she's in good health. She's she's feeling well. She's looking great, um, and it's yeah, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful relationship that they have, and nothing but you know, I have nothing but so much respect and so and revere Mrs. Jackson so much. Um, we have to bring up this part, which is the, the scene in the dock where, uh, it shows that you and Janet having a little disagreement, which, um, from the studio, uh, Rhythm Nation days and for longtime fans of yours, it was like, not, it's, I don't think we never thought that you guys would have had a disagreement, uh, but because all we ever know from the three of you is just love, 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 like constantly. Um, and of course, love, like you, you, you sometimes get into little spats with your siblings or your best friends or whatever. So that part wasn't shocking, but it was a little shocking. So were those moments like was that happening specifically on Rhythm Nation because there was so much pressure coming off control or did they kind of happen every little once in a while during all the albums you've worked on with her? Well, there's a story behind that story, but I'm not. I'm going to reserve it for later on uh, at another point in time. But um, there was definitely um, a bit of a pressure. Um, I think we probably put more pressure on ourselves than anything. But in context, what I would say is Rhythm Nation was a six month project. And that was one day of a six month project. And it's a documentary, so why not use that day? Matter of fact, Janet, Janet actually, um, I remember texted me when she was looking at the footage and she said, hey, do you remember us getting into a fight about whatever? And I said, no, I don't remember that. And she said, well, you come over and take a look at this footage and whatever, and I wanna know if it's okay for, if we use it. And I said, okay. So we watched it and I'm, I'm cracking up. I'm like, oh my God, this is so funny. This is so funny. And she said, what do you think? And I said, I think it's great. I think it's great because 
that yeah, that is how it is. And of course, the funny thing is, the next day at the studio, she walks in and she goes, "Jimmy, Jimmy!" Like she's in this whole great mood, and because because she's and matter of fact, it's funny. The reason she says she says that is because my wife Lisa, whenever she's around, she's always calling me, and so Lisa always goes, "Jimmy, Jimmy." So Janet always is mocking my wife, basically, when she's doing that. So when she walks in the studio the next day, that's that's what she's doing. Um, but yeah, it was that moment. It's like, you know, and it happens, like you said, yeah, between siblings, between, you know, people. You have those moments in the day where it's you're not getting along and you're frustrated or whatever that is. But as long as the intent is good, the intent is in the right place. And the intent was we need to make a great album. We need to make the greatest album. I think in the car I, with Renee, I said, I, we want to make a great album. We want to make a great, or whatever my line was in, in the old footage. But that was what we were setting out to do. We really felt like we had set a standard <clears throat> with control and we wanted to follow it up. And the other thing was, <clears throat> I, I think in that other in that piece, he also mentions a and Records. And that's the other thing. There was a lot of pressure on from that side of it not in a bad way, but that AM, A&M now had expectations, right? Because you're coming off of a, you know, I don't know, five or six million album selling thing. And we're isolated in Minneapolis. So they can't even come by and hear what we're doing or they don't know anything. And I think I told you the story before where um, Rich Frankel, who's in the doc for just a hot second, doing, going over the, uh, the album cover for the Janet Jackson album, the very first album. Um, but he came to Minneapolis in the middle of Rhythm Nation, but it was in the middle of winter time. And he brings the artwork up for Rhythm Nation and he hands it to me. He comes to the door of the studio. He hands me the artwork and he goes, I'm not going to hear anything, am I? And I said, nope. And closes the door. He like literally got on a plane, came all the way to Minneapolis to deliver the artwork and we didn't let him hear a thing. And that was kind of the way the, the album was. So that was the other thing. There was pressure just from the, we didn't want them to hear anything because we wanted to be, we wanted to create the atmosphere like Control, which was like, nobody was paying attention when we were doing the Control album. And so just don't pay attention to us now. We got this. We're going to figure it out. So I think there was definitely some of that. Um, but yeah, the thing was, is like Janet said, we don't even remember like that kind of stuff happening because it just... It just didn't happen. And it, you know, and so, yeah. So one day out of six months, yeah, we had a spat. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> and can you, uh, cause I think again, for anyone who has been in a recording booth um, and recording vocals, you know that sometimes you as the artist need to get into the zone and maybe you can't get to yourself. So that's what the producer is there to help you do. And I'm assuming you've had to do that for all of your artists. Um, how often did you have to do that for Janet? Cause that seems to be what you were doing in that moment was just trying to get that energy out of her. Yeah, and some days, I think the other thing that happens is that one of the nice things about having our own studio was on those days where the energy just isn't there, some days the energy just isn't there. And I think we got better as we, you know, matured, I guess, in recognizing those days and just going, you know what, let's do something else. Or let's, let's you know, let's just go see a movie or let's go, let's just go do something else. Be rather than kind of nose to the grindstone thing. Um, but, but those kinds of moments and those kinds of things just happen in the, in the course of it. And yes, you are like, um, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a coach, um, <clears throat> all of those things. And, and when people think about record production, they think about the technical side of it and the music side of it, but so much of it is psychological. You have to catch people at the right time. You have to know when to push, when to pull back, when to praise, when to really criticize. Um, and somehow at the end of the day, if you end up with a great result, then that's what it is. And so what you remember always is the great result. Like you remember the way the vocal came out, not what it took to get there. Cause sometimes it's not, not always the most pleasant thing. So, um, but that's our job. And if, and if it comes out and the vocals great at the end of the day, then we've done our job, you know? And so that's what was always the case with Janet. And I remember a lot of times she would sing and even some, and it was funny because some days she wouldn't feel like she was really doing that well, but I was catching stuff that I just was thought was magic. Like I was making little notes and stuff as we were recording. 
she'd sing a line and she'd sing it wrong, but I'd go like, oh, that's even better than what we were thinking it should be. And I'd just jot notes down. And then she'd go home at the end of the day and I'd stay up basically all night and comp the vocal, like take the little parts and the little things and the little, and the little things like the laughs and the breaths and the little things that she does that made it so her. And I made, made sure that those were always part of the recording. And, um, and then the next day she would come to the studio and I'd say, she'd say, how'd it come out? And I'll go, listen, it came out great and I'll play it. And she, her face would always be a little bit of like, wow. Like, I don't remember me sounding like that, you know, but it was like, yeah, it was all there. It was just taking the puzzle pieces, putting them together in the right way. But, um, that was always the thing. And she never even, it was funny because I remember Renee would always go like, he'd hear the vocal and Renee would go, Oh my God, Jan, that's amazing. That's amazing. And we'd be like, that's amazing. And she'd go, really? You think so? Like she never really gave it up <laughs> for herself and still doesn't to this day. She can't, she can't, you know, watching the documentary, she loves the part with her brothers, but when she says she's watching herself, she's like, that's the part that she doesn't like because she just doesn't like, you know, watching herself. She's like, what's the big deal? You know, it's great. <laughs> The uh, the footage that we saw, you know, from the the studio where you guys did have a little disagreement, and then obviously they mentioned in the doc further on just how much Renee had captured of uh, footage throughout the, like the ten or twelve years they were together. Um, like, as a fan, I I think it's invaluable material to know that there's all this footage of her and her legacy, and that it's there. Um, when you were in the studio with her, and obviously around her and Renee. Uh, like, were the cameras annoying for you or did you already know and appreciate that it was probably good that he was recording all this stuff? Well, let's see. The best way to put it is that it was kind of a natural progression. I knew that Renee was very creative. He had a lot of different ideas. And when Renee first started coming to the studio, he had, um, I don't know, a nice camera. I think it was a Canon or, or some sort, a nice little SLR camera. And he'd take pictures just, but he was like, you know, he was like a friend, like he was in the environment. It wasn't like a cameraman coming in to do it. And also remember back in those days, I know nowadays we live where your iPhone is your camera. So you just pick it up and you just shoot everything. This was the days when there was something that needed to be done. It was, um, you know, bring in a bunch of lights and it'd be a big camera and it was, and it totally ruined the mood of recording. So there was no way to really capture recording the way that, you know, you would, you could now. So um, Renee was kind of that almost in a way like the fly on the wall, where as we were working, he would take pictures and he'd do like different stuff. But then every week, literally, he'd come in with a new, actually, maybe not every week, maybe like every day, he'd come in with a new piece of equipment. Like he'd come in with a, he'd come in with a, let's see, a, like a Leica camera, right? He'd have this new Leica camera. And then the next day he'd come in with this lens this new lens. And then the next day he'd come in with this new flash or this ring light or this something. And literally every single day there was a new thing. So for him, it was just, I'm going to try this new stuff out to see how it works. And I remember he came in with like a Hasselblad camera, like one of those old kind of cameras that, you know, you cover yourself with the, with the blanket or whatever. And t like, he came in with one of those, like a portrait camera. And then I remember one week he came in with a really nice video camera, small, but a really nice video camera. And he was like, look at this. Everything's on these little cassette things. And you know what it's like, and so he's shooting, 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 shooting the whole time. We're not even aware that he's shooting. Like he literally disappeared. It wasn't like, you know, he was annoying us or any, he was just doing it. And so what was great about that in the evolution of that was that he, one day he brought in like an eight millimeter camera. I think he had a um, film camera. He had all kinds of different stuff. But it was so natural in the progression of what we were doing in the studio that it was almost like we didn't even notice it. And so it's great that that footage exists. Where it began to get a little bit over, I, I don't know, annoying, I guess I'll just use the word annoying, was when outside of the studio, like when she was visiting her mom that day or... Um, you know, just when we're, you know, out at the movies or, or we're just out doing things uh, or on vacation or whatever, that's where it began to get a little bit. I like it's good. The documentation of it's great. But in the moment, it just felt a little bit like turn off. You know, um, I think I told a story 
a while back there was a meeting, a big meeting that me and Renee were at. Janet wasn't there. We asked Janet to come into the meeting. It was a marketing meeting. And when we were done with the meeting, we were going to go grab, I think we were, I don't remember what we were going to do. I think we were maybe going, going to see Batman or something um, at the theater or whatever. Uh, or no, or maybe just go have lunch or something. And I remember Renee started talking about Billboard magazine and something and, and something. And Janet just said, Renee, remember we talked about we're not talking any business. We're just going to enjoy lunch or whatever. He said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So I think it was that not being able to turn off because as a creative person, it's great to be around creative people all the time. You know, when you're working, that's great. You're firing ideas off. But then you still have to have that separation where you leave work and now you go to your, you know, whatever your normal life is, whatever that is. And I think that that began to get <clears throat> a little annoying and that because there was never, Renee didn't have like an off switch. He always was the creative Renee with the ideas. And I think that that just gets maybe a little bit <clears throat> annoying for people after a while, unfortunately, you know, but I love that the footage is there. I mean, I did you have you seen the Beatles documentary? Not yet. No. OK, so the Beatles documentary, it was a good example of literally cameras being there every single day and capturing everything. And if there was ever a, a point in time where there one where somebody wanted to do a deep dive into the, you know, more nerdism of the music making part of what we do, it's good to know that that's all documented and, and all of the creative discussions and all the things that are happening is all there, you know, and I enjoyed, I really enjoyed seeing that stuff in the studio and even, you know, seeing the way the studio actually looked as a running studio, as we talked about a little earlier, you know, we went back there, obviously things had changed, but to actually see the studio in that condition and her on the mic and all of those things that brought back memories to me that I hadn't forgotten. They were blurry in my mind, but to actually see that see the soundboard we were using and all those different things. Yeah, it was great. It was fantastic. I'm glad I'm glad Renee was there. And like I say, he was he was a big part of the the creative process in during those times. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask you about that because I believe in the doc it was Wayne Scott Lupus who talked about how uh Janet and Renee were just such a creative powerhouse together. Mm -hmm. And I think even like us fans in the 90s felt that. Like we just felt like they were unstoppable. And I think Tina mentioned too in when I interviewed her just how much like Renee just was all about team Janet. Like he just wanted the very best for her. And yeah. so, um, yeah. What's your thoughts on that sort of just idea of them being this creative powerhouse and then it being enveloped, but with you and with Tina and with Terry and the other rest, like members of the team, uh, like what was that experience? Like, I suppose specifically in the nineties when it was like on high octane. It was for me, it was, it was, I, I loved it. I loved every minute of, of the creative part of Renee. Um, I thought that, um, I always say, you know, our saying that Terry and I always say, a barber can't cut the back of his own head. And by that, you, you, you can look in the mirror and you see what you see. But if there's someone else that has another view, another viewpoint, they're seeing you in a whole different way that you maybe don't see yourself. And that to me was Renee with Janet. Janet knew she was talented. She knew what she wanted to do, what she wanted to try to achieve. But Renee was like that cheerleader who said, you can do this. That, that scene where they're in the hotel room and he's saying, you can do this. Like, I, I see you so big and I see you, you know, that was the kind of thing that you needed. Or to me, Janet needed that push because we could say that too. Um, and we could go in the studio and, and try to execute that happening. But you needed almost that visionary who was looking at her as a fan in a way, like what what you'd like to see happen, but also then with the imagination to say, this is what it is. I was, I was talking to somebody the other day about uh, Rhythm Nation and how Renee was like, just you've got to come up with this Rhythm Nation. We got to come up with a thing and whatever. And it was like, okay, okay. And when I remember when I finally hit upon what ended up being the track of Rhythm Nation, which was taking the Sly and the Family Stone sample because Janet loves Sly and the Family Stone. And I was like, okay, so if we can figure out how to do this. And I remember playing it for Renee and Renee was like, oh my God, this is it, this is it, this is it. And, but then saying, 
but we should start it with like a prayer. And it's like a prayer. Yeah. Like a prayer. And it's like, okay, cool. Like a, like a, like a chant, like a, what, like, it's like, so it's like, okay, cool. So it's like all of those types of things were just always on his mind, like 24 hours a day, how she should look, how she should, you know, whatever. And like I said, at the end of the day, it maybe got a little bit annoying, but that creative process with him involved, I thought was great because he saw her in a way, he, he saw her the way she was, but he saw what she could be. And I think it gave her a lot of, um, a lot of confidence. And it also allowed her to just be, it gave her, she didn't have to think about a lot of things like that, if that makes sense. Like she could just be creative. She could just do the lyric and whatever, but he could say, it would be great to do a lyric like something, something, something. And she'd go, okay, cool. And then she'd do something like that, but of course put it in the context of a song. But so he was a great creative partner. Um, and I, I loved um, I loved his energy. I loved his energy during those days for sure. I asked this of Tina and I wanted to ask this of you because again, they, they opened the door for it in the doc. Um, when Janet and Renee uh, started to come apart or things go south, however you want to say it, was it hard for you as a friend seeing that, especially because I'm certain you were friends with both of them, obviously. Yeah. So it must have been hard. And do you miss Renee? I do miss Renee. Um, I, um, yeah, I, I feel like it was interesting because obviously when th when things come apart, um, you know, I'm, I'm team Janet all the way and I'm whatever she's thinking in that. And I remember at one point in time, she said to me kind of early on when things were kind of fracturing, and she said, I know you and Renee are really good friends because we would we would hang out and golf and do all kinds of different things together. Um, and she said, I don't mind if you still want to be friends with him. That's perfectly fine. You know, she said, I, I understand. And so she was very understanding. And I appreciate I appreciated her saying that um, the reality of the moment, though, because there was some acrimony and there was some different things that were happening that. I didn't agree with that he was doing um, that made it so it wasn't possible, you know, um, but she was very open to it. And I always appreciated that, that she recognized that, you know, there were that we were friends and, and that. So so I do in a way I, I, I certainly miss Renee. But like I say, I'm glad his contributions are there for everyone to see um, his, you know, the fact that um, I was once again, I was having a conversation with him. Um, somebody last night about that's the way love goes and about how important that video was and that nobody could have to me pulled that video off like renee because renee was there recreating a moment that had actually happened when she played the song for the first time for all her friends and so he was able to capture the spirit of that um in a video and allow people to see janet in a different way in the way that he saw her and um, I just think that those moments were so important, you know, just in the overall story of Janet, the overall career of Janet. Um, and I think only he was, he was in the unique place to pull it off, but then he actually pulled it off. He did just the most beautiful videos. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I'm glad that, I'm glad he's getting recognition because I think he des deserves it for sure have to bring up scream now i know you and i have talked about it before but again janet opened the door with the with the doc and i guess the the um the part that i found uh i don't know if surprising is the word but i thought it was amazing that she actually opened the door to say that as much as we the fans all love scream she did say that it was a challenge to get through it like it wasn't as amazing as i think all of the fans might have thought it was back in 95 when it came out because i'm sure all mm -hmm. of us were just like it's the two of them they're together this must have been such an amazing thing to work on yeah um and and she's she's let it be known that it wasn't so i did want to ask you your thoughts on was the recording part of it like the the the, the uh the vocal part of it a good experience and was it just a video shoot that kind of got like a little bit left of center where it shouldn't have gone that way hmm well, there's a lot of um, <laughs> there's a lot of stories within the story there. I think that um, we were always very careful in the very beginning of that to make sure that Janet was cool with it. She was on board with it, um, with everything that was being talked about and done. And I think from the inception of the song, um, 
Michael very much was, she always said, it's a Michael song and I'm just supporting him on it. I don't, she never really saw it as a duet because it was really his idea to do it. And the subject matter was his idea. And she, and you know, the key of the song was his idea. Like literally she really felt like I'm just here to, to help my brother. That was her, her thought process. And so we were there, we felt we were there to protect her in a way. And I remember before the video, um, I just remember one of the things that happened was we had agreed that our engineer, who's named Steve Hodge, who had mixed all of our songs, Michael was very adamant about, I want the song to be the way you guys would do the song. And his engineer, Bruce Swedeen, who's obviously a legendary uh, engineer, rest in peace, Bruce. Bruce um, even was like, no, Steve can mix it. He can he can do whatever he needs to do. Michael wants you know that to happen like that. So I know from the production standpoint, when um, Janet did her vocal, we said no matter who else touches this project as far as the engineering side, um, we have to do Janet's vocal. Like we have to mix that part of it. We need to mix. And so, okay, cool. So that was the understanding. So I remember when we did the mix of the song and I remember Michael said, wow, Janet sounds so good. She sounds really good. And I said, good, I'm glad, I'm glad you like it. And he said, yeah, it's really good. And then I remember sending a, the, a tape, because this is back in the tape days, I sent a cassette to Janet and I said, what do you think? And she said, yeah, it sounds really good. I said, okay, great, cool. So then I get a call from Janet maybe, I don't know, a week later and she goes, Hey, I just listened to um, the song and um, my vocal's different. And I said, it is? And she said, yeah, something doesn't sound right. And I said, well, send it to me. So she sends it to me. Well, I listened to it and I said, well, no, that's not the vocal we did. So then I called, uh, I don't know what they called. I think I called Bruce or I called Michael. I called Michael and I said, Michael, I said, did you guys change the mix or something? And he said, oh yeah. He said, we just went in and we wanted to turn up probably the hand claps or something. That's always Michael's thing. Turn the hand claps up. So I think... When they did that, though, then they didn't do the processing and things that we do, the compression and the things that we would do for Janet's video, for uh, for her audio, right? So anyway, I said, I said, no, 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 no. I said, Michael, remember the Janet vocals, we have to handle those. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. I, I didn't know. Such and such. Okay, fine. So then we went back and did it. Same scenario a week later, Janet calls and she says, I think my vocals turned down. I said, no, we just, we approved it. It's mastered. We're ready to go. No, it sounds like my vocals turned down. She sends me the cassette. Sure enough, her vocals turned down. I'm like, wait a minute. I said, did, did we change the mix? So there was some of those kinds of things that were happening. And I don't know the motivation behind them, or I don't know what it was. But those kinds of things kind of make, you know, it makes things, it can be unpleasant. I guess you could say that. Mm -hmm. So by the time things got around to the video, because of those kinds of little things that were happening where it almost, you know, once again, not speculating, but it almost felt in some ways like, like someone's trying to sabotage this a little bit or somebody's trying to make sure they're getting the one up. And it's like, why are we, why are you doing that? Cause you're in it together. And she's there to support you at this point, Michael. And it was interesting. And on the, and on the set of the video, I was um, Switzerland. Basically I was the only person that was allowed in both camps. Like, I, I would, you know, I would sit in Janet's bus and on the, on the set and, you know, we'd talk and hang out and then there'd be a knock at the door and they'd go, uh, Michael wants to see you on his bus. Okay. And I'd go over to Michael's bus and we'd hang out and play video games, whatever. And then there'd be a knock on his bus's door. Oh, Janet wants you in her bus. Okay, cool. And I remember somebody had a birthday in the middle of shooting the video and everybody came together for the birthday and they sang happy birthday, happy birthday, whatever. And literally as soon as the last note of happy birthday, everybody went back to their own sides. And I didn't realize that the record company was involved with kind of keeping things separate and keeping her off the set and all of those kinds of things. So I, yeah, I could imagine the experience was not the best um, overall for her. And also the expectation that I think she talked about, because, you know, expectations is what sets up disappointment. So if your expectation was that this is going to be a great kind of kumbaya moment for us all together. And then it wasn't that, then you're also disappointed because based on your expectations of what you thought that moment would be. Um, 
So what you see on screen and see with them together is absolutely amazing. The memory of it, though, probably isn't as pleasant as you would imagine. Yeah, it seemed like when she when we were watching the doc and she, you could see her going back in her brain, like re re reliving the moment that she was a little like melancholy, for lack of a better word, like, yes. And, and you and you feel sad because, again, as a fan, I still remember the day Scream came out and just remembering the excitement. And so uh, knowing that it was a challenging thing for her to get through, not all the way, I'm sure, but just that it didn't turn out to be uh, the experience that she she would have wanted, even though the result was amazing. Yes, I'm sure. Was was uh, was was hard on her. And um, I wanted to ask you, too, because, you know, back in 95, like she couldn't have been hotter, like you said in the in the doc yourself. Um, and I think a lot of us fans that are like Janet fans, like we felt, or, you know, maybe I'll speak just for me. Like, I felt like she really did him a solid to go and do that song, even mm -hmm. though we were so excited to have the both of them together. So mm -hmm. was it like, I don't know, Jimmy, like what the word would be, but was it disappointing to know that it was, whether it was him or his team or the, or his label that made it not great, even though she was the hot one at that moment? It was, it was a little disappointing. And one of my, but one of my things that I remember and you know this was just a, once again a, just a philosophy thing for me um, I remember when Michael played uh, You Are Not Alone and for me and I remember when it went off I said that should be your first single and he said why and I said well I said, I'm not a big fan of dredging up the past things that aren't necessarily great. And I think what's happening in your life right now, Michael, in your current life is pretty great. You're married, you know, at that point, him and Lisa Marie were getting along great. And, and they, it, there was all this great things in his life to me that were happening. So to come back from that or into this next chapter of his life, mad at the press, mad at whatever, whatever. Like, do I dredge up all of that? Like, I think your first foot forward should be, I'm in love, it's a new day, whatever. I always thought that was the way to go. And so when, you know, Scream came out, obviously, yes, it did what it did and it was, it was wonderful. But I always felt like, I just felt like it just was it was just kind of needlessly dredged up the past and then put him at odds once again with the press um, right from off the bat. And it was like and to me, it was almost like not that anybody forgot about, you know, the allegations and all that other stuff. But to me, why bring that up again? Like, just come out new thing. And I just that was always my thought about it. So I don't know that I'm answering the question right, but that was just my thought about it going back to those days. Um, I just thought that the decisions that were made weren't always, um, you know, the best decisions, I guess I'd say. Were you or was Janet frustrated um, again? Because in the doc, they touched upon it where, yeah, like she was kind of guilty by association. Like, did it get old for her? Because it just seemed like every two minutes in the 90s, he was being dragged up for something. And then she was kind of coming along with it, even though it had nothing to do with her. And um, yeah. I even believe, I think uh, I heard that even one of her tours was delayed a little bit because something was going on and they wanted to just make sure everything was okay before they hit the road. So yeah, what was it like for Janet? Was it frustrating, especially because she was so hot? I think it was frustrating at the same time. It's, yeah, well, as she said, yeah, it, it's guilt by association. It's like when when okay it's think about it just if families in general right so you have a family and uh i remember i remember i say this to my kids all the time but about their school back in their school days and i'd always tell um tyler the, the older brother their older brother uh my twins older brother i would always say don't go in and mess up at school because when the twins come behind you they're, the teachers are going to know them as your little brother or little sister or whatever. And if you were a great student or a great person, they'll be like, oh, yeah, your big brother's so great. And if you weren't, they're going to be watching you like, uh oh, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I think it's I know we, we're talking about fame and all that, but it's not even a fame thing. It's, it's basically the, the kind of guilt by association. 
you know, so the people that go before you kind of now set a trend or set a tone for what happens. And then that continues to happen. And I always say, like, I used to, used to tell people on, on Janet's team and really on any of the artists that we ever produced, I'd always say, all you guys are representing them. So let's say, you know, you work for, I don't know, New Edition, okay? And you're the bodyguard for New Edition. Well, if you go beat somebody up, you're not who you are. You're New Edition security, blah, blah, blah. That's always going to be the headline. And there's a tremendous responsibility in that. I never want anything to ever say, Janet Jackson's producer, Jimmy Jam, and then something bad happening <laughs> after it. Because... And I don't know. I just feel like that's a responsibility. You have to do right by the people that, you know, are doing right by you. So I, I just feel like that's kind of what happened with that. So she was always, even as she was her own person, she was Janet Jackson. She still was Michael Jackson's little sister, no matter what. And that was the thing. It has to be frustrating to not be able to get away from that. And then if something happens wrong on... Um, you know, on the on the Michael Jackson side, you kind of get caught up in that, whether you want to or not. So yes, it could affect a business deal you're doing. It could affect a relationship. It could affect a whole lot of things that you, it's totally out of your control. So the frustrating thing is not having control over it. At least you can control what you do, your own behavior. You can't control everybody else's behavior and the way they perceive it. And so I would guess that, yes, that does get very frustrating. We, um, you know, in the doc, they, they obviously bring up the Super Bowl situation and, and, and delve into that. Um, I just wanted to ask you from your perspective, sitting there, like you guys had done the album, like Demita Joe, I'm sure was done by the, or almost done by the time or it wasn't yeah, done. It okay. was, it was not even close to being done. Oh, wow. That's, okay. And, and that was, that was always the irony back in the theory of, oh, it's hype for the album. It's like the album wasn't even close to done at oh, that wow. point. We still were. I want to say we were probably too, I don't think the album came out until, I don't know when it came out. When did April, it come out? right? April, April, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, and the Super Bowl was January, right? So, yeah, we were still three months away from even having anything together at that point. And that was a frustrating thing. I, I said, I, I could see, and of course, publicity and stuff is different. It was before kind of the social media days. It was sort of the beginning of, you know, YouTube and, and that. But, um Yes, if, it, if it, yes, if we if, if it was a publicity thing, then it was like, then the next day the record would be out, or you know what I'm saying? Like if that was the thinking of it, so there was none of that in in the equation there. Um, but yeah, it was tough working under the circumstances of trying to finish an album and go back in and focus on that with all of this other stuff, you know, swirling around. Um, it was just a. Uh, it was a it was a really bad time. It was it was one of the worst times that recording wise that I remember because for her to have to try to put that aside for a minute and then sing songs and come up with lyric ideas and all of that it was yeah it was a it was a it was a messed up time for sure. Was it hard for you too? Because I know Jermaine talked about um, how he left the Grammy situation because of what they did to her. And I know that you had been hooked up with the Grammys for years, I think on their board of directors and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. So did you walk away too, Jimmy, at that point? No, I didn't walk away because I made the distinction and I'll make the distinction to you as I've made it to many people over the years. The way that the Grammys is put together, even to this day, is there's three entities that's kind of like form a, a kind of a triangle. There's the Recording Academy, there's the network, which is CBS, and then there's the production company. And back in that day, it was Ken Ehrlich was the producer of the show. And so those three uh, tiers, basically, or corners, basically collaborate to put the show together. Um, the Recording Academy uh, had did not disinvite I know that's the headline. Grammys disinvite Janet. The Grammys didn't never never disinvited Janet. The Grammys didn't have a problem with her in any way. And the point I make to people is, if the Grammys were on another network, if, excuse me, if the if the Super Bowl was on another network that year, let's say the Super Bowl was on NBC or was on Fox or it was on ESPN or whatever. What would the Grammys, what would her doing that 
happening on the Super Bowl, what would that have to do with the Grammys? Nothing. The only thing it had to do with the Grammys, it was the same network. So if you're disinvited and it's on the same network, look to the network. That was where the apology came. And look to, you know, Les Moonves, look to the people in charge at CBS at that point, the Viacom people. That's where the dis, you know, if there was a disinvite, that's where it happened. It wasn't on the Recording Academy side. So, um, no, I didn't walk away because to me, I was in there trying to make everything happen the way it was supposed to happen. If I'm not in there, that can't happen. If I walk away, that doesn't, that can't happen. And the people that did walk away, they should have walked away. They did the right thing. I'm not, not wouldn't judge them on what they did. It was the right thing to do. But uh, the Grammys, from their side of it, and Neil Portnow, who was running it at that point in time, was firmly in favor of her being on the show, was not asking for an apology, was had said, I think, publicly that we don't really censor our artists, like, you know, artists are artists, and what happened somewhere else doesn't really have anything to do with our show. And so that was always the, the opinion. And Janet understands that, and I... You know, I remind her of that every once in a while um, because it is kind of the Grammys and the Super Bowl are kind of related, but only because they were on the same network. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say at this point in time, I believe that, you know, obviously there's a whole new regime at CBS now. Um, and, I, and I believe that those, you know, those things are are in the past at this point. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll see uh, the fruition of that at some point, uh, you know, soon. Now knowing that the album wasn't done, because I really did think it was done. Not that I thought no. it was again a publicity set. I had no thoughts of that because that's the other part that bothers me about this whole thing with 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 uh, you know with Nipplegate or whatever you want to call it yeah. is when anybody says to me, "Oh, like she did it on purpose or whatever," I'm like, if you look at Janet's mo, her entire career, she has never done anything like that, like on purpose to be shocking right. like that. So that's why it, it it doesn't make any sense to me. And even someone like Madonna, who is a bit shocking, I don't even think she would have done it. So. Yeah. It just, it doesn't make any sense to me. So I get really irate about that whole thing. But now well, knowing that you've told me um, that the album wasn't done, did you guys even contemplate maybe pushing the album further or not dropping it right away because of everything going to hell in a handbasket? I com I definitely contemplated it, um, but I'm not the record company. And that's one where to this day, I, I don't agree with the record company's decision to move forward um, with, with the record um, at that point. Um, by the way, uh, to your to your other point, though, you know, I always said uh, if I was doing an investigation into it and you thought that it was, um, uh, you know, some sort of stunt, then to me, I would look at um, I would look at YouTube <clears throat> like did she buy a bunch of YouTube stock right before <laughs> that happened? And did she buy a bunch of direct TV or whatever the VCRs back in that day were? Did she buy a bunch of that stock? Because both of those companies were literally built on that moment, if you think about it. Yeah. So if she owned a bunch of shares in those companies, then it'd be like, oh, I, I get it. I'm going to raise the value of these companies, you know. And of course, none of that happened. But yeah, going back to the, um, going back to the album, I actually had a conversation with um, who was running Virgin at that point? I think it was Matt Serletic was the president at that point in time. And Matt Serletic, I had a lot of respect for because he was a record producer back, you know, well, not even back in the day. He was current record producer, did all the Matchbox 20s records, did, you know, super, super great producer. And I remember having a conversation with him and he said, he was asking me, you know, what do I think the single should be? What do I think, you know, that kind of stuff. And I said, I don't think we're done yet. And she said, and he said, we have like 30 songs. And I said, yeah, but that doesn't really matter. The quantity of the songs doesn't matter. I don't think we're done yet. And I remember uh, there was this push where, no, we got to be out in April. We got to be. And I, and I just was like, I disagree. I disagree. I said, I think you, I think you got to let this blow over a little bit. Um, you know, whatever blow over means at that point in time. But I think in my, in my thought, you needed to do that. Now, I understand on the corporate side, you know, corporate, the corporate side of record companies back in that day, there was always a uh, a number that they had put in their projections. And so they had to fill in those things. And I remember um, I remember working with Usher and I remember L.A. Reid, um, this is back in the, uh, 
back before 8701 album came out with Usher. And I remember that album was supposed to be done. And it was because it had to come out at this certain time to meet the projections of the numbers for the stock price and all this other stuff that had nothing to do with music. And I always admired L.A. Reid for this one. Well, I, I admire him for a lot of reasons, but this one reason he said, the record's not done. We, we don't have the right Usher record right now. So we can put it out to meet the numbers, but we're messing up an artist's career. And I like the fact that he thought of the artist like that. And so, of course, he was right. He held the record back. I think a couple things leaked out or whatever. He held the record back. And, of course, we came up with You Remind Me, which ended up being the first single, went number one. And he was totally vindicated in the sense that, yes, you didn't make the numbers for that quarter, but you made the numbers up <laughs> in the next quarter. Um, and you built the foundation for then what became Confessions. So you got to let the creative people kind of they can't they have to have the control or, or, or the the sway over the business side of things which is called why it's called the music business it's not called the business music it's called the music business you got to let the music dictate so i in many ways i thought it just in my you know experience i didn't feel like demeter joe was done but there was this push well we got to get it done we got to get it done and i'm and in my mind i just kept going why what what's the rush at this point Let's get it done and let's do it. And and, the, and there definitely wasn't a rush from uh, Janet's side. Janet wasn't like, oh, we got to have this out because I got to do a tour. It wasn't like tour dates were booked and, you know, I have to have it ready for this tour date or anything. There was none of that happening. So I just thought there was there was some bad decisions made, you know, at that point that didn't make any sense to me. And still when, don't when she was going through all that 2004 shenanigans where things weren't getting played and she wasn't getting the support um, obviously her true fans were there for her. That's like a million percent, Absolutely. but, but the numbers weren't there for her where you have the general population that would listen to a Janet tune because they, they weren't being presented with the opportunity to listen to it. Yes. Um, but from your standpoint, Jimmy, obviously being like team Janet all the way and, and, and knowing the business side of things and, and just having a good overall sense of the 360 degrees of this, did you think her career was in trouble? Did you think she was going to pull out of it? Like, were you worried? I wasn't worried. Um, because to me, it's just, you know, not to be cliche, you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, you ha you have the talent. That, see, here was the thing. I thought that Janet has always been good about whatever's happening in her life, putting it into song, putting it into lyric, putting it into material. And I think people that go through any sort of um, tragic moments, any sort of emotional moments, to have the outlet of songwriting to address those things, I think is, is, a, is it's a good thing. It's very therapeutic to do. So I think I sensed more that it was not the music she was making, but the environment and the atmosphere in which the music was being made that was more so problematic, not, not her herself. So I don't think I ever was worried necessarily because i just felt like she's going to come out of it because that's what she does that's what she's basically done her whole career um and and we see you know we see that happening now and the other interesting thing you say is because people couldn't even hear the music because they couldn't see the videos they couldn't see the um hear the music on the radio or the places where they would normally hear records um it's interesting nowadays where people can hear the music wherever they want, however they want, whether it's streaming, whether it's social media or whatever, where the corporate companies can't really control it like they used to. And people will find what they want to hear, which is why people are posting Janet music and doing that. And, and you see that, you know, as soon as the music is heard, um, on the documentary or, or in places or, you know, on Janet Jackson Appreciation Day, all of a sudden those records all go right to the top of the charts. And that's because there's no corporate manipulation. There's nobody saying, oh, take her off the chart or blacklist her or don't play her video or not. There's none of that happening. So the fans speak louder than anything else. And, the, and, and, and so one of the things I like about right now in this moment we live in is that when the fans speak, they are being heard. And they are being heard in whether it's huge rating numbers, you know, songs returning to the top of the charts, 
um, whatever those those things are, they're they're being heard. And I think that that should feel so powerful for people and so powerful for the fans. And knowing that Janet is a part of making those things happen, her overall impact on the whole industry that we exist in now is um, is overwhelming. If we fast forward a few years after 2004, um, we get to 2009, Michael passes away. I don't think you and I have actually ever talked about this. Where were you when you got the news and... Yeah, I, I'll start with that. Where were you when you got the news and, and what did it mean for Jimmy Jam? Well, I'll never forget. I was, um, June 25th is my wedding anniversary. And so uh, that particular year, it was, you know, it was my wedding anniversary, but it also was the day of the NBA draft it was happening that same day. And so we were debating whether we were going to watch the draft first and then go to dinner or what we were going to do that day. And I remember I was in my bathroom and I got, um, this is before, you know, iPhones and all of that, but we had the Motorola uh, two-way pagers that could text back and forth, I think. And I don't remember whether it was my wife. I think it might've been my, my wife heard it somewhere. And she said, did you hear about Janet's brother? And I said, no. And she said, have you talked to Janet? And I said, no. So I texted her and I said, I just heard something about your brother. Is it true? And she texted me back and said, yes, unfortunately it is. And she was, I believe was in New York at that point. I just, needless to say, it was just a surreal day. That day, every year is just the most surreal day. Um, but that's, that's, and, and I don't even remember whether we talked after that. I don't think we talked after that for a while. I think we, we texted each other and I just, I, you know, I probably just said, you know, you're in my prayers and just let me know if there's anything I can do. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a devastating moment on, on a day that, you know, at least for me personally, like I say, because my wedding anniversary and, and the NBA draft, because I'm a huge basketball fan. I mean, it was, it was setting up to be just a wonderful day, you know, that day and, uh, so obviously very tragic. Going forward, when you did start to work with, with Janet again after that, um, now I know they probably weren't as close in those years leading up to, to his passing, but I know obviously like the love is always there, like a million percent. Did you find that Janet's um, demeanor had changed? Like, was there a little bit of a of light of her life that was just not there anymore after Michael had passed? Yes, I would say there was. Um, over the years, there had been a couple of examples of um, where we, we would start working on a record and I would feel like she wasn't ready to make a record yet. Either she didn't feel like she had something powerful to say or she wasn't, she was always very sure about, you know, when she would walk in with, I remember even like Velvet Rope, she walked in with all the lyrics, like she just knew what it, what this should be. And we created music from the lyrics rather than creating the music and then she did lyrics to them. It was almost the opposite. Um, going into projects after that, she was very much like she didn't quite know. And at one point in time, we talked about maybe the album is that I don't know what to talk about, you know, <laughs> at this point. Like maybe that's what it is. But I remember... Um, I remember, well, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. We might've talked about it before, but back when we started working on the Janet album, uh, and of course, Virgin had at that point given her a ton of money to, to make the record. It was one of the biggest recording contracts ever at that point. And she decided she wanted to do uh, Poetic Justice. And I remember there was a lot of, you know, kind of pushback from the record company, like, no, you, you got to make an album. And I remember I said to them, because uh, uh, Ken Berry, who was running the company at the time, I just said, you should let her do the movie because she'll be in a better creative space after she does it. And she was, of course. I mean, it was it was a such an enlightening experience for her. And that album they got made, the Janet album, was a totally different album than it would have been if we would have just plowed ahead and just did it, you know, because of, you know, once again, because of record company pressure or whatever. Um, the other time that happened was right before All For You. We had started All For You and then she found out that um, uh, Tyler Perry had called her and said, you know, or no, it wasn't Tyler Perry. It was a uh, nutty professor. I'm sorry, nutty professor. Uh, and they had called and 
she said, I, I got to do this movie, you know, whatever. And I said, great. I said, so we're going to delay the album. She said, yeah. And of course, we ended up doing for the movie we did Doesn't Really Matter, which went number one, which then led into All For You. So the point was that once again, it was kind of let your creative muse dictate the decisions you make. Um, so knowing that, going into kind of some of the next projects, we, I just felt like she wasn't ready to make a record. Whether she didn't really have anything to say. And we were in the studio working on things, but we were just kind of spinning our wheels. I didn't feel like we were coming up with, with really great, compelling stuff. And, it, and it's tough, but you have to recognize that and just kind of be honest. And we always were honest. We always just said, I don't think we're really hitting on this. I remember at one time, too, I don't remember the time period exactly. I remember at one time she said to Terry, because Terry, you know, is the, the master lyricist. Um, and one point she said, Terry, you can just write all the lyrics. I don't want to, I don't really feel anything. And Terry was like, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> that means you're not ready to make a record. Because you have you you have lyrics, you have ideas, you have concepts. If you're saying you don't have concepts, we can come up with the no 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 no. That's not that's not how it works. Yes, we can come up with the concepts, but that's not how we want to work. Let's wait until there's something in your mind that you really want to do, and at that point in time, that's when we'll get together and make a record. And to me, that record was unbreakable. That was the record where she had something to say, where she wanted to address her feelings about losing her brother and reminiscing about some of those things, but also moving forward and, and, and telling her fans about the strength that she gains from them. And, and all of those messages on Unbreakable. I mean, that was at the point to me where she, I think, had that, you know, want to do that again. And it was- like She'd been away for a while, right? Like she'd been away for several years at that point. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I just think it's important to recognize that. I was talking to Maxwell the other day. Um, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. It wasn't Maxwell. I, well, I, I talked to Maxwell all the time. But I was talking to The Weeknd the other day. And The Weeknd said one of the things he admired about Janet was how she had the ability to pull back a little bit. That there was a sense with Michael, who he obviously loves and is totally inspired by, Michael was always bigger, 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 bigger. He said Janet was bigger, 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 pull back. Bigger, 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 pull back. And he says it takes such, um, such discipline and such kind of foresight to know that, that I don't need to do, I don't need to be over the top with this. This just needs to be subtle. And that's the way Love Goes was that moment of, you know, Yes, we could come out with something huge and big. You know, we could come with if for the first single and come out with a big dance video on a huge whatever. But it's like, no, 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 no. I'm just me chilling with my friends. He said he admires that ability. And he said it actually informed the album that he just did, uh, which was for him kind of a pullback. It was kind of like, I'm just going to make this album because I want to make it. I'm not trying to, you know, chase, you know, chart numbers or anything like that. I just want to, I just feel this music right now. I feel like my music is kind of a way to lead people out of this, in this tunnel like i want to be the light at the end of the tunnel you know of of whatever we're going through and i called him and i just said i love your album and i and any album sounds effortless you know to me it doesn't sound like you're chasing after or anything and he said i wasn't and he said but he used janet as an example of that superstar that knows when to just pull back for a second and just you know to do that and i i so i have a lot of respect for for him for for saying that Speaking of uh, pulling back, one part in the doc that scared the heck out of me, and I wanted to ask you, was the, the tail end where I feel like she was making a pre-retirement speech. Uh, and I'm really I'm really hoping it's not that because she just seemed to allude that obviously I know I can only imagine how much she loves being a mom. And, and she mentioned that she wants to focus on being a mom uh, and that she's going to go out with a bang. But please, good God, like <laughs> you can allay our fears, Jimmy, that it's not over. No, it's it's definitely not over. What's interesting is, and I can tell you because, well, I, I got to experience, my kid experience has been wonderful. Uh, Terry, my partner, had kids. I mean, I think he had his first son when he was maybe 18 years old. Like, he was really young. And I got to watch Terry raise all of his kids before I had kids of my own. Uh, and now I've gotten to raise my kids. They're all, you know, 21 up. They're all college age now. 
Um, so watching that and knowing the way that the priorities in your life change because of kids, um, but also knowing that your creativity and all of that doesn't go away, it just, to me, it gets enhanced. So I think Janet, her greatest music and impact is actually ahead of her. And, but informing that and, and creating that inspiration for her will be Issa. Um, the biggest joy in her life that she gets is being around Issa. And when she's then able to take that joy and express it in song or express it in whatever creative things that she's gonna do, we will all be the beneficiaries of that. So I think she's exactly in that place she should be. That should be her priority. I know Terry and I, a lot of people ask us when we put our album out last year, they said, where'd you guys go? <laughs> and we were like, uh, we were raising kids and we wanted to do that and be a part of their lives. And, you know, th I think that's important. And I think she recognizes that. But I also think that it, it inspires her to come up with ideas, to come up with, you know, things that people will be very pleasantly surprised uh, when they hear and when they see. So Amazing. yeah, she's not, she's not retiring. She may Thank be taking a hiatus, but not retiring at all. Thank God, because I legit was worried. I was like, please let that not be the pre-retirement speech. Because I, I, it was so crazy, because just watching those few seconds of her saying that, I can't even tell you the visceral reaction I had. Like, my heart sunk. Like, I was like, you can't leave us. <laughs> it's like, yeah. the world needs Janet Jackson. So I'm glad that, that you've allayed our fears. On yeah, that. no, she, you know, she's very much present. She's very much aware. But she's always, listen, she's always kind of worked on her own clock. She's always kind of done things the way she wants to do them. And... There's nothing, I mean, I, I didn't understand parenthood until I was a parent, quite honestly. I mean, the example I always give, because I, like I said, I'm a huge basketball fan. And I remember growing up in Minneapolis, and I remember we used to go watch the Timberwolves play. And so, you know, Michael Jordan would be coming to town, or Kobe Bryant would come to town, or like, all, you know, Allen Iverson or whatever. And I remember uh, Terry and I had seats, courtside seats. And I remember there'd be a day, like Michael Jordan's coming to town, and I'd say, Terry, I said, you know, Michael's coming to town, whatever, whatever. And he'd go, oh, you can have my seats. I go, what are you talking about, Terry? And he'd say, oh, I got, my daughter's got a dance recital. I go, what? I said, it's Michael Jordan. He said, you'll understand when you have kids. And he was absolutely right. Because like literally our schedule was always be around, do the kids have a basketball game? Do they have a, re do they have a rehearsal? Do they have a what? Like literally we made our schedule around our kids to be present in their lives. And that's where Janet is right now. It's like, Janet, can you come do this? Can you do this? And she'll go, no, Issa has a Halloween party that day, or he has a scavenger hunt that day, or what, you know what I'm saying? Like it changes your, but it doesn't mean you've checked out. It just means that you're just, you know, you've found that, that muse and that inspiration. And Issa is that, and, and it should be. So fans, don't worry. Um, she, she's gonna be there for you for sure, but she needs to be there for her son. That's the most important thing in her life, as it should be. I asked this next question of Tina, but I, I want your your answer as well, because I think this will be interesting to see how you guys are either come up with the same thing or, or, or differentiate. Mm -hmm. Janet, I wanted your thoughts on this. So what makes Janet Jackson so special, considering the fact that she is this powerful, um, creative, gifted, talented Black woman, but at the same time, she feels like she's your best friend from high school? <laughs> well, that is what makes her so special, is, I guess, her humanness. She's so relatable, um, but she's relatable because she's very honest. She's, she's not ever hiding behind anything. She just is relating what she's going through in her life. That, to me, was a significant moment, and, and it's talked about in the documentary with Control, was she, the her first two albums were great albums, but it wasn't as if somebody was asking her, hey, what do you want to sing about? Or what's pertinent to you? And maybe at that point in time, she didn't even know because it was her dad's idea that she sing. But when we got around to control, all of a sudden she was, I want to be an artist. I have things I want to say. And we're like, okay, great. What do you want to say? What do you want to talk about? And so as we would have conversations, we'd just write notes down. And we'd go, remember you talked about the Nasty Boys? Oh yeah, let's write a song about it. 
talked about being in control. Oh, yeah, let's write a song about it. So that was the thing that excited her. And so she still is that girl next door, I guess, in a way. But she just is very honest and puts everything out there. And her smile is amazing. Um, it makes every, it's contagious what she does. Her smile makes everybody smile. Her melodies make everybody sing the melodies. Her voice is not an intimidating voice that you listen to and go, oh, I could never sing like that. You kind of go, oh, no, I can sing along with that. You know, it's just all of these different kind of things. Um, so it's, it's I, I don't know, it's hard to articulate. But your observations about her, that she's like literally the superstar who's the girl next door who's your best friend, that is such a unique quality. Um, and, and I also don't think she's aware of it. Like she just lives her life without being so aware of who she's trying to reach or who her demographic is and all that. Like she doesn't concern herself with any of that. She just kind of always has been honest in the music that she makes and the choices she makes, um, which I think is very refreshing, I guess I would say. Two more questions for you. Sure. What does Janet Jackson mean to Jimmy Jam? Um, I'll just say she means everything to me. Um, she means everything. When I, I look at my life, I look at my musical life, I look at my personal life, I look at my family life, I look at my life with my, with, with Terry Lewis, my, you know, for, well, 40 year partner, soon to be 50 year partner next year. Um, I, Janet has really been the, the, the foundation of, of all of those things, of all those great relationships. And, um, meeting people and traveling around the world and, and all of the things. And, and certainly my, my musical muse, like the person that always inspires me. Like when I write a song, I always feel like if I do it correctly, I want to hear her voice on it. Like she's the voice that informs my, my songwriting. So um, I guess everything. I mean, she just means everything to me. I can't imagine what my life would have been without her, but I'm so happy that I don't have to, <laughs> you know, like she's, she's, she's such a major part of my, of everything in my life. Now for Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis fans, is there anything that you can tell us that you're working on? You're in the studio. I know, I know lots of it needs to probably be secret, but we always love to know what you guys are up to. <laughs> well, we're working on, um, actually quite a few things. So, um, we're working on a Jam and Lewis volume two. We released volume one and uh, we're very happy about the reception for that. So we're working on a volume two. Um, we are, as everybody keeps asking us, uh, is Janet gonna be involved in volume two? And we say, we hope so. Um, but she'll be involved in her, in her own time. You know, it's God's timing for that kind of thing. But um, we do have some interesting uh, things that we put together for that with her and we'll see you know, what happens there. Um, we're also in the studio with Yolanda Adams currently, which we're really excited about. Um, we, we are in the studio with a new edition. Um, they're getting ready to do a, a tour. So we have some things working with them. Um, and just, um, we're just kind of back to, I guess, full-time music making, I guess is what I would say. We went, we went, like I said, we went through raising our kids and all that. Um, Terry's daughter is is now and, and son they're his youngest are now college age so Terry's now is great because he's going back and forth between the colleges the dance recital one of them's having the basketball games another one so he's still kind of living a little bit of that life which is great but um we're doing um we're back to doing music full-time now um and we're just absolutely enjoying every aspect of it and we're also involved on the technology side we have a company called just listen um which I was going to say is the logo on my hat, but I'm not wearing that hat. Where is that hat? Your hat is oh. sick today, Jimmy. I don't have my You're always so this sick. is the so okay. So this is the flight. This is the flight time logo, the hat and feet logo, and uh, this is uh, we're celebrating this year is the 40th anniversary of flight time. Terry wow. and I shook hands in 1982, and we said our agreement was never in writing. It just was a handshake, and we just said 50-50. We're splitting everything 50-50. So that has survived for 40 years. So we're in our 40th year of flight time this year, which is, you know, interesting as, as Janet's in our, her 40th year of recording. Uh, and next year is, I have the Jam and Lewis headphones. Next year is our 50th year of Jam and Lewis. I met Terry in 1973. So we go back a little bit away. So we're just having fun and just really enjoying 
in what we do. And we and and we have you know we have merch. If you follow us on our socials, we have merch that's gone up that's doing very well, and lots of new music to come. You know, um, so we're having fun, and we we appreciate the fans, Kelly. We appreciate you um, for looking out for Janet in the way that you do. Um, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And honestly, every time I get to talk to you, it's like I can't my little 13 year old self loses her mind because I, I'm <laughs> I've obviously been influenced by you and Terry and just the way you've taken you've taken care of Janet as well. So on behalf of the fans, like thank you, especially because this was such a big moment for all of us to see this documentary, to have you a part of it and to have you break it down for us and give like extra analysis is absolutely amazing. So thank you for doing this. Absolutely. My pleasure. That is Jimmy Jam. Don't forget to uh, follow him on his social media at Flight Time Jam and official Jam and Lewis. Hey, it's Kelly. Thank you so much for hanging out and watching and listening to our interviews. We always appreciate your time. Please make sure to follow us on our YouTube channel and also hit up our website so that you can subscribe to our newsletter so you are always up to date with everything that we have got going on with the show. KellyAlexanderShow.com slash subscribe.